Welcome back, folks, to the WP Tonic this week in WordPress and SAS. We've got a great guest here. We've got Balder Janusson. I'm totally butchered his name, but he's used to it, and I've done a superb job of that tribe, but you're used to that. We're going to be talking about all things WordPress. Is WordPress really an open source project? What is an open source project? Um, we're going to be delving into this fascinating um, subject and Boulder has a lot of experience in open source projects and WordPress itself. I've also got my co-host Kurt. Kurt, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, sure. My name is Kurt Von Annen. I own a company called Manana Nomas. Uh, we focus largely on membership and learning websites, and I work directly with the folks at WP Tonic and the great folks at Lifter Elements. And we've got Boulder. Would you like to quickly introduce yourself to the tribe? Um, I, I would like to. Um, the problem with being old and middle-aged is that introductions, if, if they were supposed to be faithful, would take forever. Um, the short version is that I've been doing this forever. Um, um, since uh, probably the first website made in I think ninety six or ninety seven, so it's it's, it's getting there. Um, it, but in terms of um, the like the open source and uh, WordPress experience, uh, um, I before uh, I'm currently a consultant and freelancer, but before I um, uh, before I switched over to that. I was working for um, open education, not-for-profit uh, organizations and working quite a bit with, uh, for example, outfits like Pressbooks, which uses WordPress um, heavily in a open education context. Um, and um, for the past few years, like most of my work has been uh, in the sort of either open education or open source uh, sectors. Um, but like post COVID, um, the, like with many uh, things, changed a bit. So I'm, I'm more in a working more in a freelance capacity um, as people need. Um, but you have been a you have been a long term contributor to the core of WordPress. And well. No, uh, not to the core WordPress. Um, I've a uh, long term user um, and uh, sort of been working adjacent with people who have contributed to. Um, and I'm, I'm the guy who helps out people who do, who do that work. Right, yeah. um, so, um, uh, well, like, um, for example, with the we're doing the press books thing, is that um, even though I wasn't actually working on the core press with project, most of my, uh, quite a few of my um, responsibilities involved <laughs> making things possible for them. Um, in terms of integrations with other projects. Um, so quite a, quite a bit of um, like API work, um, plugins, um, that sort of thing. Uh, currently, most of my WordPress work is um, in the sort of on the plugin side. Um, like I'm currently working on a um, project um, with a UK based company for integrating their API into WordPress websites. And the simplest way to do that is using plugins. So well, yeah. Yeah, it's, a bit, it's a bit eclectic. It's a bit mixed. Um, well, yeah. but... well, you got, you got a fair bit of experience. So should be a great discussion before we go into the meat and potatoes of this great interview. I've got a couple of messages from our major sponsors. We will be back in a few moments, folks. Hi there, e-commerce store owner. At Omnisend, we help more than 100,000 e-commerce customers just like you sell their products. We're an all-in-one email and SMS marketing platform that helps you reach your customers, grow your audience, and increase sales. In fact, our customers have seen incredible results with Omnisend, averaging $72 in revenue for every single dollar spent. And if you ever have a question, our award-winning customer support team is available 24-7 every single day. That's one of the reasons we have more than 6,000 glowing reviews and ratings all across the web. So get started with Omnisend today and start growing your business with better email and SMS marketing. Coming back, folks, want to point out we've got a great, list of the best WordPress plugins, plus some special offers from the sponsors. Plus, you can sign up for the WP Tonic newsletter, a weekly newsletter of the best WordPress 
stories and tech stories. You can get all these goodies by going over to wp-tonic.com slash deals, wp-tonic.com slash deals, and you can get all the goodies there by WordPress Drive. What more could you ask for? Probably a lot more, but that's all you're going to get from that page. Sorry to disappoint. I've made a career of it. Uh, um, so let's go straight in. So um, so what do you see as some of the critical elements of a true open source project? Is it is it totally just based on the license that the software is being built on, or is there more elements to a true open source project, in your opinion, Holder? <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, there, there, there has to be more than more to it than the license. It's, it's you can, uh, it's so easy to create a software project um, that technically follows the a the uh, the license to a letter, but breaks every spirit of it. Um, and specifically, um, one of the risks with open source projects is that they become effectively proprietary code that nobody else is able to modify in any way with in a meaningful, meaningful way because there's so many um, external factors, whether it's organizational, financial, or just in terms of uh, comprehending the code that prevents other people from contributing it. And Honestly, I think that's one of the concerns that um, people like me who come from um, have been quite involved with uh, open source and open education. The concern with, with uh, WordPress is that it's effectively turning into a um, sort of a shared source company more than an, uh, a, a true open source one. That it's just, it's, it, we're, uh, it's that it'll be something that's entirely driven by. Uh, WordPress.com uh, and the Gutenberg uh, development team specifically, and that everybody else will find it harder and harder to influence the like strategic and overall direction of the project. You might be able to like fix individual issues, and um, like if you're making a theme or a plugin, you might be able to tweak and fix specific bugs that affect those projects, but. Um, in terms of affecting the overall direction, what like what is WordPress and where is it going and who is it for? Um, if if it hasn't already, uh, then uh, in the long term, the um, this I think it's going to be dominated entirely by WordPress.com and the Gutenberg team, and specifically by Matt himself. Uh, uh, like it's always been it's always been an issue with open source or the whole benevolent dictator for life. Um, <laughs> that, um, the idea that there's a single tyrant or you know, like benevolent uh, dictator uh, that directs the path of the project, they could turn tyrant to, or they could um, like switch to a more democratic way of working. But matters always um, in the past. He and WordPress yeah, have tried. They've, before, they've, can I interrupt? I'm not being rude, but I think we need to lay out some bigger elements before we go into the way Matt runs things or does. Yeah. Um, you you said the spirit of open source that if something technically meets the requirements of the license, it's not it still cannot it can still be judged as not being truly open source because it's not adhering to the spirit what mm. is in your mind what is this spirit part of the equation that you would utilize to judge a truly open source project i think uh, i wasn't being rude in interrupting you but i just felt that we need to clarify what the reasonably quickly, maybe two to three key points around this term of spirit that you utilised at the beginning. Um, that's absolutely a, a very good question. And the core one, the absolute, you know, 
prime one would be community participation in the direction of the project, both the development and the direction. Um, as in, it's not dictated by um, a single um, company or even a small group of company, but that it, it's inclusive of people in the community as well. Uh, and that includes both users and people who have built their livelihoods around uh, around it. So um, community is a big thing. And that's w one of the so what has always been the strength of WordPress. It's got massive, massive community. It's, um, and that's, that's what took WordPress global more than anything else. Um, and um, that is at the heart of the issue is, is the fact that it has to come from a plurality of people rather than a, a, single, a single company or organization because people within a, a company are replaceable. They are they're res they're human resources that are just swapped out. But uh, community is, more often, uh, is a more organic thing that forms around a, um, a project. And that's what defines open source um, is the community. Or to be specific, if you want to go for the whole um, um, the hippie um, free software definition, that's what defines free software versus uh, open source because um, the term open source was originally coined specifically to um, define a path to just get the. Well, oh, oh, I need to interrupt. I need to yeah. interrupt again before I throw over it to Kurt. Is I totally understand what you've just said, but the problem in my mind, and it's not. I'm not basing this as a criticism of what you've just said because much of what you've just stated, I totally agree with. But that, my only problem is, if you just say it's community, that's a bit, to my heart, it's a little bit vague, isn't it, still, saying it's based on community because one person's concept of what community is can be totally different to another person's idea of what community is. Yeah. Um, so do you want me to uh, uh, give examples? Well, that would be helpful because, you know, it, this is tricky, but I do know there's been a number. This is not, I don't know if you would agree with this. Um, this this tricky situation isn't just specifically um, for WordPress. There's been a number of high visible word uh, open source projects that have, had to deal with this subject and some have dealt with it by collapsing others have overcome and moved on um it's so it's very diverse about how open particular open source projects deal with this but my research on it seems to suggest that it's not that uncommon so First of all, what's your thought on that? And then maybe you can give a quick example. Um, yeah, so one of the issues is, um, I mean, if we want to be specific in our terminology, um, there are several different kinds of open source. Um, the first kind would be the one that is um, essentially open source by sort of commercial or distribution need, um, like MongoDB. Mm -hmm. um, it's maintained by a single company. It's uh, effectively just using open source as a, um, to reach, to basically for distribution to reach their customers and, uh, and um, for, as, a, as a marketing thing. It's whether they switch away from a technical uh, open source license or not um, is probably irrelevant, uh, irrelevant to them because they they aren't really using open source as um, in terms of what like either the Free Software Foundation or the open source consortium uh, intended, which is that they have specific goals. One is to use... Um, 
the crowd or or a plurality of, of a higher visibility into code to improve code quality the bazaar model which is, which is what was the goal with the op with open source consortium and the free software consortium uh, free software foundation their goal is uh, about establishing freedoms for the users uh, so when you're using just for purely for as a commercial endeavor as a you don't really need either one of those things. You could use just a shared source license um, uh, to do that. That's what's happening, is that a lot of the companies are switching to uh, basically licensing that more reflects um, like the old way that Unix, like the before mm. Linux, before BSD used to be distributed. In that, it used to be distributed as source code. Um, um, because it was like a given that um, you'd need the source code to be able to properly deploy the uh, the software uh, in your environment. Uh, so it's a purely functional thing. Um, we're getting a lot of companies that started off um, as the a broader open source or free software companies are switching to the sort of uh, shared source model um, that's closed in spirit but open in, in terms of that, you can actually read the code because as a as response to the uh, um, cloud hosting issue where um, things like Amazon Web Services can basically take your code and provide their own services without paying you anything. So um, these companies were uh, implementing a lot of work and code without getting, uh, getting paid for it from their perspective. Um, and if your motivation is purely commercial, then obviously that means that the open source or free software is not doing the job for you. So they switch. It's a logical thing from their perspective. Um, there's a second um, type of open source uh, project, which is similar to uh, like Ruby on Rails. Oh. Ruby on Rails exists as a external, um, um, like a positive externality in the ways what uh, econo economists call it, as in, it, they made this to build their own product, uh, products, but they ha make it open source because that both uh, spreads uh, those ideas for how to make software. It opens up that code to more eyeballs, but it's not required for their core product. It's like um, they benefit from it, uh, from it, but it's... Um, they could close it off if they wanted to without actually impacting their own, uh, uh, own, uh, own product. It's it's community participation without, uh, but the community doesn't really direct the project um, because um, that's kind of one of the controversies with Ruby on Rails is that the uh, Rails core and specifically Basecamp tend to make decisions unilaterally that affect all of the people who are using the project. So it's not community directed, but um, then the third um, um, sort of example, which is what, I would have classified WordPress traditionally, which is that it's um, made by and for the communities. Uh, the WordPress community has um, quite often in the past had a big influence in, in where things were going. They, um, like uh, when uh, WordPress.com, um, like, or, uh, would uh, try, uh, try to, um, like with uh, the initial release in Gutenberg, the, uh, the, um, um, pushback in terms of accessibility there is not something that would have um, happened with a um, project that was more um, directed by the single core uh, company. The fact that that happened, the fact that that had an effect and resulted in uh, extensive work over t uh, uh, sort of since then to try and improve the accessibility was evidence that um, WordPress it was at least at that time a like community a community directed project. So that those would be the three different kinds, which is that um, essentially entirely commercial, partially commercial, but um, benefits the community. Or and the third one is that it's primarily community, but benefits the commercial companies involved. Um, oh. Thank you so much. I, I think that was really very helpful. I want to throw it over to Kurt now and move it on to the next question because we only got a limited amount of time. You have to come back. I know. <laughs> Sorry. You know, no, it's, these are not simple concepts, are they? No. Uh, um, so no, I, in fact, yeah, 
the, the more I have these conversations about open source, especially with these other pros that Jonathan introduces through the show, the more confused I get about open source, just to be honest with, with everybody that's listening. Um, when I hear of like the community running the show, I am, I immediately have flashbacks to like custom themes with all kinds of weird functions and lockouts and the classic editor baked in and, and a customer comes to me and this thing's a mess. And I think to myself, well, a theme should be appearance and a plugin should be function. And that's the way that my head works. And when community gets to run with the ball freely, I think sometimes things get weird. But beyond all that, um, if we go to the next question and I say open source, making open source and then having it last 20 years and, in, and then some, what do you think of these biggest challenges when we look at things like legacy code and making sure that everything works forever? Yeah, I mean, you could literally like talk about like write the entire doctorate theses on these and uh, people, I mean, people literally do that. There's like, you, you, if you, there are, you can go on archive.org and uh, um, there's going to be um, papers and essays there on this topic. It's not, there's no, they, they don't have found a single answer, but I mean, the problem, uh, like um, in terms of like WordPress specifically, is that it was idiosyncratic to begin with. Like um, WordPress, the way it handles um, quite a few things has never been exactly normal. It's like not not been entirely mainstream PHP and uh, my SQL um, handling. It's always been, I'm not saying it's wrong, but the, it's always been a little bit different. Um, and that makes things complicated, uh, like uniquely complicated for WordPress. Uh, and it's a complicated problem to begin with. Um, and, um, and then you have the issue on uh, with web projects where there is this uh, massive changes in the web browser as a platform itself that, itself has added huge capabilities where uh, things that took you um, hundreds of lines of code to do something in the front end now might be a single line of CSS. Um, so it's, it's, it's also a question of where do you draw the line? Like how far back do you want to yeah. um, uh, su uh, support? And also how far into the future? And you might discover that you can't do both at the same time. Um, if you're gonna like update a code base for the long term, you might have to leave people behind, and people don't like being left behind. <laughs> they, they, they really, um, yeah. So um, uh, unfortunately, there's no easy um, answer to that. Uh, unfortunately, um, um, so well, because my observation is very tricky. Um, there's been other CRM, CRMs, other open source projects that have handled this tricky, not very well, and it and yeah, and it's outside observation. It's damaged the project, but on the other hand, being a total slave to backward compatibility, I think it has its own drawbacks and problems with that, with being able to really concentrate on moving a project forward in utilising the most modern technology and just, just the technical baggage of trying to keep backward compatibility. It makes a complicated project even more complicated. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, there's two, um, actually two good examples from the closed source world, world uh, Windows versus Mac OS. Windows uh, loves supporting everything that has ever touched the Windows platform from the beginning of time. It's it's an absolutely mind-boggling uh, achievement that they still have the level of backwards compat compatibility that they do. Mac OS breaks everything, <laughs> not quite everything, but they keep yeah. breaking things and updates because they don't care. They're like, whatever. Like if you're, if you're no, uh, like a, um, old software that gets broken, um, old um, laptops like 
my mother tried to update an old MacBook Air the other day and she didn't manage to reach me in time um, before doing it because I would have told her not to. Uh, but it, it, it's dead in the water now, so I need to figure out a way to res- resurrect it. But those, those are two, those are like the two um, biggest examples of those two different approaches um, that are in our current computing. And, and for, depending on your goals, uh, either one is equally valid. But I think we can agree that both have massive downsides um, and seem to add, uh, it's just a, the, the biggest difference between the two is who ends up doing the work. Uh, on the Mac OS, the integrators, uh, the third-party app developers, and oh, he didn't pay for. He's oh, he's back again. He's coming back, folks. He said some stuff. Oh, you're coming back. You cut off completely there. Um, I'm going to have to bring you back into the. There you go. You got cut off completely there. Where did I? Where did I end? Um. You were talking about Mac and how they move the um, technical overhead to the third party people. Yeah, so um, the the difference between the two approaches is is basically who ends, ends up doing the work. Um, on the Mac OS, it's the um, third party software developers, it's the users, it's the anybody who's trying to extend the system on Windows. They've taken on a lot of that work themselves, and a lot of the work ends up being like on Microsoft or on uh, driver uh, drivers as developers. And I think the same uh, thing could be applied, for example, to WordPress and other open source projects. Is that um, do you want to preserve the work of all of your extension or plugin developers, all of the um, all of your ecosystem? Do you want to shift the work over to them? Or do you want to take it on to on to or, or on yourself? But if the core well, project is going to take it on, they need the money. They need well, resources. When, when it comes to the WordPress, my observation is you've you've got a situation where it's the worst of both worlds because, <laughs> of, because a lot of the overhead is on the third parties. Yet uh, um, it still wants total compatibility to the back. Um, so that's my quick observation with that. Um, I just want to comment before we go for our break, our mid-break. Would you would you say that um, going back to your three examples of what an open source project can be? I'm sure there's, there's a host of other different flavors, but the three that you outlined, I thought you did an excellent job. Would you would you agree with me that WordPress? It's something like it's only my own observation that it has attempted to move from example three to example two, which was the Ruby Rails example. There's been a, a real attempt to really move it to that Ruby on Rails example. Would you agree with that? Yes, uh, I think that's actually core part of a lot of the um, like controversies and the tension that um, exists among that. At least I've I've witnessed and heard from in the in the WordPress community is there. At least there's the feeling among um, some uh, users and developers that this is the case. Um, of course, it's impossible to know whether that's the actual strategy or direction because you know we we can't read the minds of the people involved. But it's certainly what it looks like from the outside to a lot of people. Um, and I kind of think it's the responsibility is on um, like the people who are directing the WordPress uh, project today to to clarify what's going on and to make sure that everybody understands. Um, like, what are what what is the project trying to become? Um, and because it's like as soon as you just say outright what if you want to change something, and you then you the, as soon as you tell people about it, then that is makes a lot of the things quite a bit easier and less uh, and uh, less ambiguous. I totally, I totally agree with you. Um, I know we need to go for a break, but I just want to add this other reflection and see if you agree with it could it it's probably driven by business but could it also be driven that you had a a base of developers that were you 
that were you used to use in PHP, but the technical um, change, the major, you're also going through a major technical change um, that's come from, that's understandable in some ways to utilize in modern JavaScript and JavaScript libraries like React. And that had a consequence as well. Can you see where I'm coming from? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it had a role role to play um, somewhere in the decision making. It's extremely hard, though, from the outside to to kind of like guess just how much of a role. But I, I'm sure it was there as a at least uh, at the very least uh, uh, um, an item on on the meeting <laughs> if there was a meeting. Um, so. Probably at least in part. Um, yeah, more so. You know, uh, so the technology dri dri drove partially a decision because the bulk of your contributors haven't got the technical or the experience in a particular new new road, a new pathway. So you're going to look at more internal resources to supply the technical base but you don't want to lose the feeling of community. So you want you want both things at the same time, and that's why you, it becomes a bit of a hot mess, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I think that's uh, an entirely plausible um, theory about how things uh, stand. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, it could be. <laughs> We're going to go for <laughs> We delved in some deep subjects. Um, I think... I think we've done a reasonable stop. It's been to the quality that I thought it was going to be the conversation. I don't think you would hear this kind of conversation on a lot of podcasts. Um, we've got a great second half. We're going to go for our break. We've got a couple more quick messages from our sponsors that are really appreciated. We'll be back in a few moments, folks. Tired of hosting providers that can't handle high traffic loads? Convesio is here to help. Our platform can handle any amount of traffic all without slowing down or crashing. With immediate Slack support, performance optimization, and a team that thrives on resolving technical challenges, your e-commerce business is in safe hands. Learn more about Convesio at Convesio.com. This podcast episode is brought to you by Lifter LMS, the leading learning management system solution for WordPress. If you or your client are creating any kind of online course, training-based membership website, or any type of e-learning project, Lifter LMS is the most secure, stable, well-supported solution on the market. Go to lifterlms.com and save 20% at checkout with coupon code PODCAST20. That's PODCAST20. Enjoy the rest of your show. Three, two, one. We're coming back, folks. I want to point out, if you're looking at a great hosting partner, especially in the learning management, membership, and buddy boss area, why don't you look a lot? look at becoming a WP Tonic partner. We've got some fantastic packages for you, the WordPress professional. You can learn all about our great packages and how we support you by going over to wp-tonic.com slash partners, wp-tonic.com slash partners and find out. We love to be your technical partner in these type of projects. So, on we go. Um, I'm going to throw it over to Kirk. Over to you again, Kirk. Well, this question kind of hits me because I think as an agency, when I deal with a client, I prefer to have a single point of contact. If, I, if I'm an agency and I'm signing into a multi-person Zoom call to get six opinions before I change the heading or the image on the homepage, I've got a nightmare on my hands. And I think about WordPress and the 43% of the internet that it is and the, com the huge community and mass that, that it must be. And then I think about the most vocal people at the top of the community 
and some of the unhinged things I see on X and things like that that they post. And so I come to this question kind of lightly, but, but in all seriousness, how effectively can an open source project actually be managed by a committee? Who picks that committee? And, and is this a real problem or is this just hyperbole that, that gets blown out of shape? I mean, it's a real problem um, because, uh, well, because it is. It's like anybody who's, who's attempted to, like, I did quite a bit of work, um, um, like, being a, rep a representative of a not-for-profit uh, at the um, W3C. Um, working on standardization and the which is probably the definition of of committee work and it is and uh, uh, politeness prevents me from using the language um, that is the most stop me. Stop yeah stop me. <laughs> but it's 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 just uh, it's quite possibly the worst way to do anything but it's also in that context the only way to do anything so um you're kind of um you know doomed to uh to suffer there um the uh, the committee work tends to work best um if you know exactly what it is that you um need to be doing like the exact design this is uh, you can see this um uh, in standardization work like on the w3c that when they are uh taking something that's already been implemented by um web browsers and they're just defining and clarifying the core uh, like the edge cases and making sure that everybody th throws the same error at the same time they can work really well but again looking at the w3c when they've been designing their standards from scratch before implementation it's been a disaster every single time it just XHTML2, for example, um, it just never went anywhere. Like <laughs> loads of interesting ideas, but <laughs> that was all never, very interesting. Yeah, but it? never went anywhere. And the same thing um, that when you get back to uh, open source projects, um, there you basically um, have uh, two options. You can either go really, really slow. Um, and do things by committee and make sure everybody is on board and there's a consensus and... Can I um, say something here? I, I actually disagree with you quite passionately. Here. Okay, go on. Um, I, I think this argument of committee um, is used as a bit of a red herring because there obviously is a lot of truth to it, but that's why we have um, representative democracy in a lot of areas. Um, basically, you can have a committee, but you just um, you just make sure there's one person or small team that actually runs things, and yeah. that and you just have a committee, just like um, in a balanced public company, you have a CEO, you have a chief financial officer, but you have a, a steering committee, and that committee um, is doesn't are not in, involved in the day-to-day -day running of the business. That is not their purpose. Their purpose is outside or should be. Obviously, this fails in a lot of... Um, but a, a true steering committee should be of people that have the experience and the credos and the ability to stand up to a CEO or some of the other individuals if they're doing something blatantly wrong or damage the company medium to long term i i don't see anything different in a in a open source project where you have a steering committee but you you give people four or five years to actually run it um i see it as a completely red hair in this argument in some ways I mean, it depends on on um, how, like the like you say, the you talk specifically about a steering committee, and it depends on where in the process the committee lies. Where in the process the sort of group uh, group um, collaborative decision making uh, resides, um, 
when it's a problem, like we, uh, I was describing earlier, that usually means that the committee is right there on uh, at, on some um, vital crossroads and deciding things where it probably shouldn't and where it probably should be on a higher level, deciding direction and strategy rather than the individual um, actions. Um, that's probably one like one way of um, like making a distinction between the two. Um, but the problem in that in open source is that generally speaking, open source is managed by whoever shows up. Yes. Um, so it's like make, uh, making sure that there are specific roles and specific hierarchies and specific structures can be a lot of work to make sure that, uh, like both make sure it's in place and make sure that people are actually following it because sometimes they well, don't sure they can't, follow they it. Can't, they can't be done for free, basically. Yeah. It's work. It costs money. That that costs money means you need an, uh, a parent organization of of, of some sorts, uh, and you need a revenue model. It needs to, you know, somebody needs to be uh, profiting from the whole whole endeavor. Um, so, I mean, the the answer um, would then seem to be that it can be done, but it's very tricky. It can, it can easily go wrong. Um, um, but specifically to what um, Kurt mentioned in that, um, it having a single contact point, having a, 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 some something that call some person a, that coordinates is vital, uh, no matter what model you uh, you use. Is that especially with outside work? Is that outsiders can't people who stand outside an organisation can't be expected to. Um, like navigate the internal structure of the organization to be able to collaborate with. And that applies both with um, uh, like corporations and with uh, uh, open source organizations. You need, um, you need some coordination point, uh, uh, somebody who takes care of then takes that matter internally yeah, and, and pass it on. Called, yeah. It's called proper um, governance and structure, isn't it? Not all companies have that, and not all open source companies have that. No. Um, the other thing, it's not on their list. The other thing that I, I've been accused of it and other people is that if you don't contribute to core or one of the Siri projects around WordPress, that you haven't got the right to say anything about it. Um, I think that's absolute shit myself. Uh, um, um, Basically, and it's another, it's another technique. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm very passionate about WordPress, and I want the best for it. But I'm not working for Mac Malweg for free. I'm just not gonna do it. Um, not when he wants to move, in my opinion, from the example of number three to the example of number two. And some people would say it's getting to the stage where it's in version one you you showed but i don't think that would be fair i think it but i definitely in my opinion it's moving to example two in the first half of this interview that you so clearly outlined i'm just not prepared doesn't mean i'm not passionate and i don't want the best for wordpress but i'm just not going to contribute um and i think asking individuals to contribute a lot of time to something like that or even companies where you have no real structures pushing it a bit what would you what would your response be oh well um well one of my early jobs out of, out of college was at a, a fairly traditional software company that had uh back in those days had an actual department just for testing um, and they were amazing at their job. They had such a talent for finding and pointing out problems that it was just awe-inspiring, but they had no talent in fixing it because that's not their job. Um, the ability to spot a problem, describe it, and uh, describe what needs to be done is not the, uh, uh, so the same as the ability to actually do it. Those, those are two separate skills. So as soon as you shut down critics for not contributing, you are basically shutting off one of the most important sources of information a project can have um, because people have expertise that's relevant for finding and discovering problems that they're fixing, but they 
wouldn't have the first clue on actually how to do the fixing because that's a different skill. So uh, I think it's extremely short-sighted to um, demand. Uh, to basically, it's just an, uh, a tactic to shut down criticism because you don't want to do the work, uh, in my opinion. Right. I'm going to throw it over again to, and I think we're on question four, Kurt. So. Yeah, yeah. And that one is um, not just in community or governance or those things, but in WordPress as a whole. When you think of WordPress as a, as a whole environment, what do you think are the most, I, I, both sides, what are the most significant challenges, but also what are the most significant opportunities that we see in the space in 2024? I mean, one of the interest, most interesting opportunity would be um, the changes in the uh, social media landscape, um, both in terms of two different open and federated um, protocols appearing, Blue Sky and, and uh, uh, the um, Activity Pub or, or Mastodon. Um, so WordPress doesn't really, um, is it, sort of is, is its own thing, but it's, so frequently has to interact, interact or integrate with other um, uh, social, uh, social media platforms. I think they, they, it has a huge opportunity there to figure out new ways of inter integrating with these social media platforms that weren't possible with the closed ones. So you can actually change completely the equation for how somebody's uh, e-commerce site or uh, uh, like uh, a company's website interacts with the their social media presence on these platforms. I think that's a, a, a very, very interesting opportunity that um, there's a lot of uh, potential innovation there and and uh, untested ideas that uh, could be tried out. So um, I don't think, I think we're, there's people in the WordPress community already um, and trying things out. So I think that's a big opportunity. Um, and that, well, the challenge is, is basically uh, well, everything else, the world. Just look at this, this state of the world. I don't even need to like go into any specifics. It's just so many things that are just... Um, because it's like you need to exist in the world. You need, you need to exist in the, in the community and in, in, you know, with your, your local government and, uh, and uh, your local economy. And if everything around you is, is having problems, then that's going to be uh, a problem for you. So I think, that, uh, but I think that you could say probably that challenge is probably applies to all of us everywhere, uh, no matter what we're doing. Uh, so that's not specific to WordPress. Um, but I think a, a specific challenge to WordPress is to figure out why, like, does it want to become the um, CMS monopoly or oligopoly on the on the web? Is that a good thing? Uh, it's like, do would it would WordPress be improved um, by actually focusing on a deliberately having a smaller market share and uh, uh, serving a smaller market to better instead of this ambition of just constantly becoming a bigger and bigger share of the uh, of the web. I think that's that question and figuring out a, a, an answer to that question because I don't think it they've I don't think it's anybody's consciously thought should we dial down the market share. Um, but I think that that question is probably the biggest challenge to that's specific to the WordPress project. It's like, is it too big? Is it already too big? Does it need to be smaller for everybody involved? Um, I don't know. Uh. <laughs> I've kind of got a follow-up question in this, and it and it's more about global perspectives because Jonathan and I are captured here in the United States, and there's a lot of feel that WordPress is a United States product. I mean, there's just no getting around that, right? And and a lot of the community that tries to drive the influence is here in the United States. But when I speak to people that I work with overseas, they seem completely disconnected from some of the nonsense that's a distraction over here in the States. What, what do you think is um, your perception of WordPress as an American product versus WordPress as a global product? Is that even a fair question? I think it is. Um, like, for example, I, uh, we, you know, I go to Icelanders are very, um, there's a lot of family oriented activities, like our idea of uh, um, the, like the close family is probably closer to the Mediterranean one where it's like distant uh, aunts and uncles and cousins. So we do a lot of uh, family gatherings and meetups um, with 
quite a large amount of uh, a large number of people on them. And whenever I I talk about working on the web, the invi- like invariably people mention WordPress. That's like <laughs> um, that's their like if anybody has worked at a uh, on a like on a on an institution or organization or company that has a marketing presence on the net, it's probably WordPress. Uh, and there, that's their, um, it's their entry point into, into the back end of the web of how the web functions. And like you say, I don't, I don't think the, the, um, the U S or the English language communities issues um, in word, in WordPress. Uh, I don't that, I think that registers with, um with those groups and those users much if at all uh they complain about the some of the consequences like gutenberg um like um uh, if you speak to somebody who works in marketing and has been forced to switch to gutenberg and they don't like it they will talk about it ad infinitum um which is not exactly fun when you're at somebody's uh 70th birthday party and and trying to get distracted and not thinking about work, and then you meet somebody, a relative or a cousin, who just talks about WordPress all the, um, all the time. So, um, but yeah, no, there there is definitely this sort of, um, especially with global pro- global uh, open source project, this sort of decentralized nature means that each country, its language, tends to have a see a different slice of the overall uh, community. I think that's probably a good thing, but it there is, though, the sense that, like, if you speak to Icelandic users of WordPress, most of them will say they have no control over the project. They don't feel they have a voice anywhere that can reach or influence um, any of the decision-making the project. So they both feel disconnected from the drama. So they don't, probably don't even know about the drama or the politics, but they also feel disconnected from the decision-making um, and the overall strategy. So it's a bit of a, like, uh, six of one, half a dozen of the other um, situation. Nice. Thank you so much for the feedback. Jonathan, I'm going to toss it to you, and I've got to run to my other call. Yes, Kirk's got to go off to the previous... Um, a follow-up question. I, I think all, everything we've discussed during this podcast um, is, I've used this term a few times, a kind of witch's brew, but the catalyst is the Gutenberg project. And we're almost six years into it. It has only 200 with full-site editing themes Um, a figure that I was exposed, it still only has about 200,000 active. If that is not classified as a failure, I really don't know how you could classify that. Um, They, um, I wanted it to, um, I'm still very pro Gutenberg, the actual idea, because Um, WordPress really to be effective it really needed to improve the editor experience and just relying on third party solutions totally I didn't feel was appropriate Um, but um, I I was look I uh, I publicized it through Twitter I was watching a, a quick video from Paul from WP Tuts who's not an enormous lover of Gutenberg, but is a very fair and honest individual in my experience. Um, and he did, a, um, he did a review of the upcoming update. And when you look at the UX, the usability in UX of native Gutenberg, in my opinion, it's a dog's breath. Um, it's... And it, and it get, it's getting worse, and this is only my opinion. The reason why it's getting worse is they're not really dealing with the UX and usability or the usability and UX mess they've got. And they're adding more and more functionality with every update, and it's making the usability and UX flaws even worse because they're adding even more complexity to it. Um, so the situation on that side, the situ- 
And their argument, and one of the arguments is used, is the reason why the, the usability actually using the interface and the UX design is really quite, in my opinion, quite crummy, is it's open source project. I refute that completely. I think it's a load of bullshit myself. What, what's your views of what I've just outlined? No, I, mean, I, think, I, think, I think blaming the like blaming the nature of the project open source on on um um you know it's, it's saying that it's the nature of the project's fault that they might not have good user experiences i mean it doesn't make sense even on the face of it because of how centrally controlled um gutenberg specifically is it's not managed like an open source project it's 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 centrally managed so they should easily be able to bypass if that were true because i don't accept that as true to begin with but even if that were true that this was a always a problem with with uh, open source um projects Gutenberg is specifically structured to be able to bypass that problem. They should be able to design a cohesive, um, um, thought-out experience um, for the editing interface because of they are this um, separate cluster um, of a of a project that is much smaller and should be easier to manage um, for this specifically. Um, but it's like. I think it's clear to say that um, Gutenberg works for fewer people than um, it's supposed to. Uh, I think that's a diplomatic way of of, of saying it. Um, like, and if it was supposed to work for everybody who uses WordPress, then it's obviously a failure because it it doesn't. It just plain doesn't work for everybody who who needs to use WordPress. And even like in some of the integrations I've worked on, it's caused problems because of the opaque um, relationship between the editing user interface and the um, actual HTML that's outputted tends to, has in some cases made a few um, integrations a bit more complicated than they would have otherwise. Uh, and I think that's, it's, it's solvable, but it makes things more complicated. And as soon as things are more complicated, like you say, they tend to be harder to use. They tend to be uh, more error prone. There tends to be more that goes wrong. Um, and uh, I mean, the sad fact is that this was probably avoidable if it had been properly managed from the start. So it's like, um, so it was a, a bit of a missed opportunity. This could have been a much, much bigger deal, like bigger positive deal than well, it the was. People, the people, you might disagree with the way they are running things and you might there might be some personality clashes you know some people really hate my guts it doesn't really bother <laughs> me it doesn't really bother me that much not because i'm a sociopath you know i wish you know but i just accept i'm not everybody's cup of tea you know it doesn't make them terrible and it does there's other people that i think are total sociopaths you know um so I'm not much bothered what a sociopath thinks of me. Uh, um, but these people aren't idiots that are running this project. They're much sharper people than me. I'm, I'm just an average guy. Um, they're much brighter than me. They must be aware of the UX and usability problems because when you when you watch that video from Paul, it's just it's a sad state of affairs, really. Why can't they get to grips of it? Or is it that they don't eat, there's so much in the bubble, they don't even realise it is a problem? Uh, there, I mean, it, it might be like, it could. Well, it's possible that the answer is different for every single one of them. But one common thing I've, uh, I've encountered is the fact that the extremely smart programmer types um, they tend to find complexity easy to manage and navigate. And uh, so they don't um, experience, there's a class of user experience problems that they don't, aren't sensitive to um, because they, 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 they're like, 
yeah, that's not the problem. I just need to do that, 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 fine. It's like, how is that? That isn't hard. And so sometimes the people being smart can actually work against them. Smart people have different needs, like not smart, but like people who have specific cognitive skill sets of um, being able to reason about uh, specific kinds of problems. They have different needs from user interfaces from people who are, have a different kind of training. Um, so I think that coders uh, specifically are a very, very bad benchmark for um, they themselves generally are not able to see um, most user, interfa- user experience problems. Um, because they just have a completely different way of thinking about how they use their software tools than than like ninety percent of the population. So they probably don't feel that. They probably don't see these problems um, to the same extent as everybody yeah, else does. Yeah, I'm only surmising this, and I have no facts to support this. But do you think it's also Matt? Matt and some of the key people in automatic, they have a kind of programming background. Do you think that their real focus is on um, the quality of the development team and they totally, it might be not consciously, but subconsciously totally, I'm struggling for the right word because um, reduce the, the value of UX and usability in the in the actual project they 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 there's a kind of blind spot there to some degree um i don't know i mean it's very hard to kind of like guess at people's motivations or or you can only just look at what they do and it's obvious that um what wordpress has been doing with gutenberg is not putting the same priority on user experience as you'd think was sensible for that for the well, project. It's a bit of a contradiction, isn't it? Even mm. by utilizing his and his team, his key members of his team um, um, public statements, because they want this all embracing. So you think usability, if if you match it to the public statements, you think that would be a core but when you look at the end product, there's a total mismatch, isn't there? I mean, it might be that they simply don't have the um, skill set um, because um, UX design is not just you actually, quite often you need a level of, if you want to recruit uh, world-class designers, you sometimes, it's not, one of the things that makes it easier to recruit world-class designers is having some, or some design skill yourself um, to be able to spot when somebody actually is likely to be a good contribution versus bad. So then it might be a um, like employment issue, a talent issue. They just might not have the people on board that um, are I, capable I of doing it. I think you're totally spot on there, but we can only make guesses we don't know do we are you okay to go on for the next two questions or do you have to call it a day no no i i, I, I still have some some stamina left <laughs> um so how do you um you know i've got you know i utilize ai i've got a little bit of dyslexia i found ai, AI to be really useful in my business processes i've been utilizing a lot of technology of the technology for over a year now but also the other side of me thinks it's totally blown out of all proportions. But in the end, it will be like the internet, make an enormous change. So I oscillate like all these technologies. But um, when you look at them, there's always a load. Of, there's real change and there's just waffle, isn't there? It comes with it um, always. But... Um, how do you see AI? Is a you know? How do you see AI? Where we're going to be in a year's time or eighteen months? Do you think it's going to be in a very similar scenario with with improvements? But or do you think there's going to be a a quantum move in the next year or eighteen months? 
So um, I actually wrote a book on on the business risks of uh, generative AI last year. Well, that's why I'm, uh, I, I haven't yeah. read it, but I didn't know um, you, you so wrote I could, the book. I, I could talk for hours. Yeah, no, um, but have to come back. Be... <laughs> to come back to have to chat about that. The short version is that, uh, irrespective of the technology, um, and you can debate the technology itself back and forth, the companies involved are fundamentally dishonest, like open AI. Uh, now, I mean, and, and I mean this in like an absolute dead serious. These are some of the history involved of the uh, with the people in this field as a general is very dubious. You have... Um, research papers that are resurrecting concepts like phrenology of being able to detect whether somebody's criminal based on the shape of their head. Uh, you have... Well, like, I'm doomed then, aren't I? Yeah, I'm doomed, I'm all doomed. of us. Uh, and there, then you have uh, the, the fact that quite a few of the people involved are were, were um, very deep into crypto coins and like what looks from the outside um, as just entirely fraudulent behaviour. So when I say that these are... To, obviously, you're based in Iceland, so you're okay, but you need to say, mm. in my opinion. In my opinion. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is like, um, in my opinion, based on like the outside perspective, looking at the things for, uh, like without knowing what's going on in people's mind. Um, uh, very important two words, in my opinion. Yeah. Opinion, three words, in my opinion. Um, but the, the 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 risk there is that um, the first one is that we don't actually know whether the technology is working as well as claimed because all of these companies are they're both run by people who used to be involved in crypto coin and whether that in your mind automatically associates them with fraud and uh, criminal behavior Never. Never. it's it's like uh, that depends on you but I know that there's some association uh, out there that uh, that are involved in that goes for pretty much all of these companies. Um, we can't entirely trust either them, their decision, or the data that they're releasing. So we don't actually know. Like, with the release of um, GTP4, um, they made all sorts of, OpenAI made all sorts of claims about what this uh, technology was capable of doing, um, but they didn't give anybody access to the data needed to replicate those findings. Then later, when people manually replicated those findings later on, they t it turned out they had op uh, like overstated the capabilities of the model for those specific tests by like 100%. They would like, the performance was literally half of what they claimed. So the caveat here is that I think that no matter what the technology is capable of doing, it's going to be doomed by the fact that the people involved are not to be trusted. They are running horrible companies in horrible ways and doing but horrible word, things. I just want to use, you utilise the word doomed. That's I mean, it's going to be... It's uh, a financial bubble uh, currently, oh, wow. that, that like, and the bubble is going to burst. And whenever a financial bubble bursts, it's going to take out a ton of companies with it. Um, so we can't rely well, on the any... Present argument, the present argument is that the um, large companies will be able to reduce their work, um, their, in the amount of people that work, they will be able to... Use, really not if they want to do the same thing the they're doing today. Like, these are not... Like these are tools that are very can be under specific circumstances very useful to uh, increase people's productivity in specific ways, yeah. but they don't act like the product productivity gain in most studies is something on the order of like ten to twenty to thirty percent, depending on how synthetic the task itself. Like depending on how isolated the task can be from other um, parts of the um, project. Like a 10% gain does not let a company lay off um, like 10% of their staff. Well, not, of, not normally, not any of the business no. books are. So, right. so the layoffs that are taking place are completely unhinged. They are completely disconnected from any reality of what this technology is delivering. And that's another risk is that they're acting on the, on the absolute best case speculative efforts of what the technology might be able to do in five years, but they're doing the layoffs today. 
And that is, you know, that actually is an ex existential risk for these companies. You, there's a, there's a, there's a, a non-zero chance that these uh, these companies might be cutting to the bone and actually killing the organisation and setting off into a terminal decline, uh, where they take a, a profitable company and turning into a loss-making one within the space of two three years. So these these like there's the disconnect here is massive between what the company is doing and what the technology enables. And that worries me. It worries me a lot. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> um, last question. <laughs> last question. Um, so, uh, you know, if you had your own time machine, HG Wells, or your watcher, Doctor Who, and you've got your own TARDIS, and you could go back to the beginnings of your career, you know, it doesn't have to be something enormous, you know, um, because we, we all change, don't we, during our career. And some of us don't, which is very sad. But if you could have, like, just one one little tidbit you could tell yourself or some little hint, um, what is anything come to mind that you, if you could go back into your early self at the beginning of your career that you wish you knew now? Oh, um, oh well, yeah. Don't bother with learning macromedia director. It's a complete waste <laughs> I of time. That. I mean, when I when I was doing my degree as a mature yeah. student, the head of the department had a film about director. And he yeah, director. And um, so much time I wasted on that, and then yeah, it turned out to be completely worthless. He loved yeah. it. He loved it. CDs and I mean that. about the. The, like with the lingo, the program language, there was, it's like it was completely non-deterministic. You could have the same like piece of code, copy and paste it into a different project, doing the same thing, and it would break in the other project. There was no discernible reason. It was just like oh, the worst development ever. Uh, ever. And it had a life of its own, didn't it? Literally, yeah. But it, it, it also did, it turned out it wasn't as lucrative as I thought it would be. Like uh, when I started learning it, it's like, yeah, this is going to be good for like uh, uh, the occasional like paying the bills and doing doing some CD-ROMs. And it turns out CD-ROMs just disappeared overnight. And that <laughs> that turned out to be not a thing. Waste of time. So, yeah, that would be my advice to myself. Don't bother with Macromedia Director. Uh, and like you know, put an upper limit on how much time you're going to invest in in Flash as well, because that's not going to oh, go anywhere well, either. I did. I did action. That's how I got into the web. I was one of these terrible action script yeah. developer types. I did, but it was a hobby. I had another business, and I did my degree part time, um, um, because I was the only person in my family that's ever done a degree. Um, so far, my my nephews and nieces have. Um, done degrees now um but um the guy that was running my course he was a maniac anyway he was absolutely didn't like me because i wouldn't put i was a mature student i was running a business with almost 30 people working for me and he started coming out of his bullshit and it <laughs> it didn't, it didn't i wasn't gonna have it so he loved me didn't he uh, um so uh, um, there we go it's, yeah. been a, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I think it's been a great show. I've really, really enjoyed it. What's the best way for people to find out more about you and your ideas? Um, just my website, uh, balderbjarnason.com. Um, if you manage to, through some miracle, get the, get the spelling right, uh, you should uh, find me. Uh, don't just Google the name. There's a risk you might actually find the uh, Icelandic footballer, Balder Bjarnason. There's 13 of us with my name. So um, I'm usually at the top of the uh, search engine results. Not always. Depends on whether he's made a business deal. He went into re uh, turned into um, a restaurateur after he quit football. So um, I, I, I occasionally... Uh, by accident, get email, get his emails where somebody just assumes that Balder. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> we won't yeah. go there because I bet so, be the like a, uh, I got, um, so if, if you're based on my experience of UK football, that uh, could be quite educated in some mm. way. Uh, um, sorry, that's English humor. <laughs> I will make sure that the link. Um, is in the show notes, folks. The, the notes will go up first thing next week. All the links will be there, folks. Thank you for supporting the show, folks. We're getting more listeners and viewers. To help the show, maybe you could share it on your popular social media platforms and that will get more people joining us. 
We will be back next week with a WP Tonic Roundtable show. We've got Jason Cohen, the um, founder of WP Engine, as part of the panel. It should be a really interesting. Jason is always a fantastic guest. We will be back soon, folks. Bye.